Good afternoon and welcome all to another edition in the lecture series, The Road to Republic, 400 Years of a Political Experiment, brought to you once again by the Barbados Museum and Historical Society and the Department of History and Philosophy at the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill Campus, in partnership, of course, with the Embassy of the Argentine Republic to Barbados. So far, I know um, many persons have viewed previous lectures in this series, and uh, there has been a consensus that increasingly every week, uh, the quality of lectures uh, are get even better, which is a difficult uh, feat to pull off. And therefore, I am sure that this week will be no different uh, as we discuss what is the, what promises certainly to be a very, very important uh, topic uh, which will surround an interrogation of the meaning and the significance of republicanism, public opinion and concepts of the republic. Now, of course, it is very, very important that those of us in the public get the opportunity to hear the thoughts and ideas of our public intellectuals uh, whose insights greatly enrich the national conversation and thereby contribute to the development of our country. Therefore, this series, which seeks to take the audience on a journey across the political and social history of a very, very unique quality in a very, very unique part of the world, uh, is vital not only for the insights that it gives us into the past, but certainly on our collective future. And that is why it gives me great pleasure today to introduce to you today's speaker. Christina Hines is a senior lecturer in political science and is the head of department at, uh, sorry, she's, she's the head of the department of government, sociology, social work, and psychology uh, at the University of the West Indies Cato campus. Dr. Hines, as you know, was sworn into the Senate of Barbados as an independent senator in April, 2022. Dr. Hines holds a PhD in international relations from London School of Economics a master's in international relations from the University of Kent, a, a postgraduate diploma in university teaching and learning from our own UWI, and a bachelor's in international development studies from St. Mary's. She has published a book, Civil Society Organizations, Governance and the Caribbean Community, which actually Dr. Hines, I bought earlier this year. Uh, and certainly for those who are in the audience, if you haven't yet bought it, uh, it makes for a very, very good read. She has also written journal articles as well as book chapters on a variety of topics relating to Caribbean governance as well as international relations and political economy. Dr. Hines has served extensively within the International Studies Association since 2015 and as I'm sure many of you are aware she will serve as vice president effective March of next year. She has worked as the Caribbean, um, sorry, she has worked as the Caribbean Studies Association's program chair between 2019 and 2021, and she currently sits on the executive there. Dr. Hines is a host of Down to Brass Tax, as we know, a, a very popular local current affairs radio column program, and has contributed newspaper columns as well as social and political analyses for media houses across the Caribbean. Dr. Hines has also represented Barbados as national field hockey goalkeeper. She has served as, and has served as a female vice president of the Barbados Hockey Federation between 2016 and 2018. Dr. Hines also serves in advisory and executive positions for uh, other local non-governmental organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, to address us today on the meaning and significance of republicanism, Public Opinion and Concepts of the Republic, Senator Dr. Christina Hines. Dr. Hines, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and thank you for reading my book. I'm really flattered. It is a pleasure to be here. I have to admit that I am coming to this lecture with a little bit of nervousness as I am not a historian. And this is supposed to be something historical. So I must admit my deficiencies here, but I thank the Barbados Museum and Historical Society and the other entities, UWA, 
um, the history department, as well as the embassy for inviting me. And I really do hope that I will provide something that I don't know if it will top what has gone before, but that will be some food for thought. So I'm going to share my screen. I hope that you can all see this. So this is my topic, the meaning and significance of republicanism, public opinion and concepts of the republic. This was quite an interesting one to be given as well. In particular, since I have not done a public opinion survey, and gauging public opinion is something that is not necessarily very easy to do in the absence of one's ability to, re to reach a wide audience. We can say that there are many publics in Barbados, even though Barbados is a small place, and their opinions on Barbados becoming a republic may vary. So I will speak to that part on the basis of some of the things that I've heard in my capacity as a moderator on Down to Brass Tacks, also as a lecturer, which gives me the opportunity, and I would really say the pleasure of interacting with a lot of young people and hearing their perspectives. And also in some of the other circles in which I move that you've heard of in that introduction, um, in my club, my hockey club, and other areas where I get to meet with people and invariably somebody will approach the doc as I'm often called at hockey and start up one of these conversations. So that's what I will base my views on the public opinion on, but I'll begin by what I know a lot more about. And that's Republicanism. Republicanism. So we can look at some definitions. There's a definition of a quite well-known, I would say, definition and popularly used of republicanism as freedom as non-domination. This connects with a long Republican tradition of thought that shaped many of the most important institutions and constitutions that we associate with democracy. That's a definition from Pettit, 1997. From our own Caribbean context, we have another definition of republicanism from Macintosh. Republicanism is a normative principle that speaks to a form of political rule in which the sovereign power of the state is said to be located in the people as a constituent whole, but is exercised by their representatives elected on the principle of universal adult suffrage. A republic is therefore understood to be a representative democratic state in which the state's power is constitutionally limited. These definitions are quite useful. Although we can see some similarities between them, I do want to say that there are differences in how these two authors conceptualize republicanism. For Petit, for instance, he does not necessarily view democracy as critical to republicanism. What is critical is non-domination. Democracy is one way to get to this, but what I find interesting about his discussion of the topic in his book that is actually titled Republicanism is that democracy is important in as much as it delivers non-domination, but democracy can also be problematic if it leads to domination, what we know as the tyranny of the majority. So there are other mechanisms that are as important as democracy itself to ensure the end, which is freedom as non-domination. And he differentiates this from the liberal tradition, which he asserts sees freedom in a negative way. Rather than freedom as non-domination, it sees freedom, he asserts, as non-interference, which is a kind of negative approach to freedom. So, so long as no one is interfering with you and your private business, that is freedom. He makes an interesting parallel to um, slavery. And he says, for instance, you may be enslaved, but your master leaves you without interfering in your business 
but you are not free because there is a possibility of domination. So freedom is conceptualized differently in his perspective, although he does admit that at the left, the left of center of the liberal tradition, it does coincide with what he would call the traditional Republican approach. I think starting with freedom is really important in the context of the Caribbean because much of what our independence movement has been about at its core is freedom. Indeed, one could assert that much of what we have seen throughout Caribbean history has been this tension between freedom and domination. We have seen continued efforts for freedom and to break the unfree system that colonization imposed on persons living in the Caribbean. So while there are many who would frame discussions of republicanism in Greek philosophy, in, you know, they look back to Rome and the Republican Rome, and this is quite useful. They look at the British tradition, the French, American Revolution, the significance of all of these. I think in our context, it is useful to ground this in thinking about the aspirations for freedom of the people of the Caribbean. So in doing this, we don't necessarily have to focus on the French Revolution or the American Revolution, or even the glorious revolution of 1688 in England. We can focus on other things that have happened in the region. So we can look at the Haitian Revolution as really being a symbol of fighting against domination and quite ironically doing so at around the same time that we have the French Revolution that sought the same, but really did not see Black people as worthy of non-domination. So there is this exclusion as well in the Republican tradition that viewed this as applicable to an elite, this elite constituting white men in particular of a specific class. So we've seen by the time we reach the 20th century, a broadening of this, a broadening of this over time so that it is applicable to all. And in our context, I would like to root this movement towards becoming a republic also in resistance to slavery that we see throughout our history by many people whose names we do not even know. Some of them we know. We know Bassa, we know Nanny Greg, we know a few of them, but many we do not know their names. We see this in the uprisings in the 1930s that helped to ground in some ways our labor movement. We see this in the movement towards the British West Indies Federation in the middle of the 20th century. We see this in the movement towards independence. All of this is really about freedom and independence and thereafter republicanism are about or should be about attaining this. So I go on here to highlight, as I've just said, that republicanism at its core is about freedom. But if we look more specifically at some of the nuts and bolts of republicanism, how do we get to this freedom? Well, this freedom rests in the people. It is for the people and therefore sovereignty, the power really lies in the people, the public. And what happens is that people delegate this responsibility to hold authority and ensure their freedom to representatives. So this is how we get representative democracy tending to go hand in hand with republicanism. A process of deliberative decision-making is important. So we should have discussions about how a country functions, how we ensure that freedoms are guaranteed, and also to ensure that the voice of the public is heard, public opinion is heard, and that this voice does not exclude minority groups. Those who are delegated with the responsibility to engage in this deliberation, and the public should be engaged in the deliberation too, I should mention, but those who we have delegated with authority must be kept in check because it still is possible for those same persons who are supposed to guarantee our freedom 
to be the ones that threaten it. So the people should keep them in check and the separation of powers between lawmaking, executive, um, administrative um, powers, as well as judicial functions should be separated so that each of these entities, each of these functions keeps the others in check. And we also have the democratic process, the going to the polls as a way of keeping those who are delegated this responsibility of the people in check. This is where I think sometimes there's a little bit of confusion. One of the questions I've heard people ask is whether Barbados becoming a republic means that we will become like North Korea or like Cuba or China because these are called republics, people's republics. And this is interesting because um, what we have in this idea of a people's republic is something similar in a way, which is that sovereignty lies in the people, but the people are represented collectively through a singular party that is then responsible for the happenings in the republic. This is quite different from what we see in a democratic tradition and some such as, as Petty and indeed McIntosh would assert that this is not what republicanism is about. Um, Petty notes that this is a, a populist kind of distortion of republicanism. But in the, the version of republicanism we are talking about, which is that which tends to be connected to democratic traditions as a way of maintaining or helping to guarantee freedom the emphasis is on equality among citizens, both as individuals, every person is, is equal, and as a collective, peoples, if we think about the international relations perspective, peoples, people living in different countries are also equal. All right, so whether you're in the United States of America or in Barbados, there is equality between these sets of, of sovereign groupings, right? Citizens are not subjects. And in this way, we see this notion that republics are anti-monarchical. So there's, there's no one who is more important than who can have absolute power over you. You can stand eye to eye with anyone. And even in cases where there is a monarch, people are equal to the monarch. So this is one of the, the core things I would say also in the Republican tradition, if we're talking about what Republicanism is. Justice is important as is the rule of law. And these are supposed to guard against arbitrariness, against the arbitrary domination of people that can lead to unfreedom, lack of freedom. So the rule of law cannot be, we cannot have law, laws that are arbitrarily created. And this is why we have the separation of powers and the deliberative process that should help to ensure that laws do not infringe on people's rights, do not infringe on equality, and indeed lead to freedom. This is what this should really be about. And constitutions are important for providing guarantees of this. And outside of um, Britain, we generally have these constitutions as written guarantees. So these are ways of thinking through in, in definitional terms what republicanism is. As I noted, it is, it's easier to have this simplification to say that a republic is basically a state that doesn't have a monarchy as a head of state. That's simple. But if we look more closely, what we can observe is that states with ceremonial monarchies may in fact function in the same way as republics. How can we say this? Well, if we look at the United Kingdom, for instance, Montesquieu argued, asserted that this is a place where the republic hides under the form of monarchy. And this is because power really lies within the House of Commons, in the lower house. This is the elected body. And although we have a kind of bargain that has occurred in the United Kingdom that has allowed the British monarchy to continue, it really doesn't do anything. It doesn't do a whole lot apart from provide ceremonial functions and some such as Hegel asserted that it provides the embodiment of the state in an individual. 
So we have this head of state in, in this context, Queen Elizabeth II. But in truth, it is the prime minister and cabinet that has executive power. It is the parliament that provides the legislative functions, and then there is a judiciary. So there is the same kind of separation. There is equality. And we could even assert that the monarchy is governed by specific sets of rules that keep it in check to ensure the same non-domination. So this can lead us now to the Caribbean context, because if it is that in the Caribbean, we have an adaptation of the Westminster system, what some would call the Westminster Whitehall system, then does this not mean that in the Caribbean, in the Commonwealth Caribbean in particular, I'm talking about, because if we look at the wider Caribbean, there are other things that pertain. We still have territories that are a part of the United Kingdom and France, for instance, and we have countries that have other systems, um, presidential systems that are republics um, and, and other systems too, like Cuba. So we can talk about Dominican Republic, Cuba, and if we're thinking about states, um, territories that are contained within states that are not independent, we can look at, for instance, Puerto Rico, um, British Virgin Islands, and we could go on. But to be specific here, I'm talking about the Commonwealth Caribbean in which we have constitutional monarchies. So if in some ways they have, I shouldn't even say developed systems, but adopted systems that replicate in some ways what pertained in the United Kingdom. And if we're saying that the United Kingdom is in some ways effectively a republic, what's the big deal about becoming a republic in the Commonwealth Caribbean? The queen does not have any jurisdiction over the affairs of these individual countries. The governor general is the queen's representative and again provides mostly ceremonial functions. So what is the big deal about becoming a republic? As McIntosh asserts, Commonwealth Caribbean constitutional monarchies are representative parliamentary republics. So McIntosh also asserted that within the Commonwealth Caribbean, these entities, these states pretty much function as republics. So why, why change? So I've provided here a little bit of an explanation as to why these are de facto republics. The structure is derived from the colonial relationship. So we have mixed government. We have the crown plus two houses. So, however, as I mentioned, the crown is not doing a whole lot. Why this is important, although in some ways we do have, all right, we have the division of powers or the separation of powers and these checks and balances in a way in our system, although there is a level of fusion as well. And in this way, institutionally, some might assert that the American type model of a republic, the presidential, pure presidential model is a, a better way of separating powers. There is still, despite the fusion, some separation. The separation is a little bit more difficult to see in the context of the Caribbean, because of how small our houses, our chambers tend to be. And this means that we can have situations where almost everyone in the lower house, the House of Assembly in our case, is in the cabinet. So then there is complete fusion of executive and legislative functions, and there are limited checks available. But if we look, for instance, at the United Kingdom, where you have a larger parliament, you can see how there are these checks still possible with a backbench, opposition, and other parties. So it, it doesn't necessarily work as neatly in our context. There is some fusion, but in theory, at least let us say, we have a Republican kind of setup, even in the absence of officially becoming a republic. So why, again, become a republic? And I'm saying that this is a continuation of our decolonization process. It's not just about the actual functions. It is not about the institutions alone. There's also something deeper 
that is at stake in moving towards becoming a republic. And this again is freedom. This is part of the continued march, walk, trek, whatever you wanna call it, trod towards freedom. And it is important for us in the context of the Commonwealth Caribbean, places that are significantly different from Canada and Australia, because we do not have majority white populations. The majority of us are descended from those who were enslaved. We know that there are others who are descended from indigenous people who also face the brutality of colonization. We know too of the process of indentureship. And then there are others who have come along the way throughout our history. Keeping holding on to the British monarchy is really holding on to that past, that history of oppression that denied freedom, denied it by law and continue to de deny it in some ways by custom. So this move towards the Republic is not really, in my opinion, about whether Commonwealth Caribbean states are pretty much republics anyway. It is about continuing to break this link with the colonial past. It is part of the de decolonization process, which I believe is still underway, even as independent states. Even so, even as we say that moving towards becoming a republic, or in our case in Barbados, having become a republic is important. It still holds on to these colonial vestiges in the way in which we have done this. And this is by continuing to replicate this mixed government formulation, though modified. So what we have taken is a symbolic step. It is a first step, it is a tiny step, in my opinion. It's a tiny step because Although we have formally broken those ties, we still maintain them by not revisioning how we govern ourselves without rethinking the relationship between the state and the society, the state society and the economy, without thinking through these things and really asking ourselves, what do we require for greater levels of freedom? It's a symbolic step and it's one that is important and I don't want to um, make anyone think that things that are symbolic are unimportant. And this is one of the things that I've heard come out in some of the public discussions, both about this and about tearing down Nelson's statue. Oh, it is just symbolic. But I don't like this notion of just symbolic because things that are symbolic can be quite significant, perhaps psychologically as well, but I'm not a psychologist, so I won't lay too much claim on that. So this takes us now to the next part. And this next part is the public opinion side. So what about public opinion? What do people think about Barbados becoming a republic? I can tell you some of what people outside of Barbados think. I've been invited to quite a few um, panel discussions, to some interviews, some media engagement in Jamaica, for instance, Antigua and Barbuda. Those are the two that come most easily to mind. I did one also in New Zealand, that was quite interesting, and one in Australia, Canada too. And what is really striking is how significant those outside of Barbados have viewed this step, at least from my experience in those settings, especially in Jamaica. So the, the session I was in Jamaica was really very fun because um, some of those who were in that event were saying, you know, this is how we are pulling down Babylon and that Barbados is you know, a revolutionary kind of state, which I found a little bit amusing considering how we think of Barbados and how often people tend to view Barbados as quite passive and Barbadians as quite passive. Anyway, if we want to think about public opinion, I do want to say that public opinion was sought in respect to this issue with the Ford Commission. And I have the report here before me. And what we see is that in the Ford Commission, and this dealt with constitutional review between 1996 and 1998. At that time, I was a teenager. And now I'm definitely not one, far from. This sought public opinion at that time. 
And what we have noted in this report are the number of activities, engagements that were held in order to gauge public opinion. Not necessarily perfectly, but definitely to get a feel of the pulse in Barbados and also in the diaspora. So if people have a chance to look at this um, report, I would really recommend it. It is quite interesting and useful to think of some of the perspectives that were held in the public between 1996 and 1998 on this topic and also by the commissioners. So what this notes is that there was public opinion, opinion was in support of a ceremonial Barbadian head of state. So in other words, continuing the system that we already have, basically switching out the governor general for a president. And there, and this again reinforces the fact that we were pretty much a republic anyway. But there was no desire to take another step that vested executive powers in the head of state. This report also noted the government's intention to hold a referendum on the matter. The, the commission did not recommend a referendum, but the government at the time had the intention of holding a referendum on the matter. So not just wanting public opinion, but really wanting the public to indicate that it was in favor of this change. So although there is this view that the question was settled in 1998, I approach that with a bit of caution because as I mentioned, I was a teenager then and I am not a teenager now, far from. So how do we know what public sentiment is? Is it fair for us to assume that because people were in favor of this setup in 1998, that they are, no, that they were in 2021 when we took this step. I don't know that it is fair to say this, especially when I consider the questions that are coming from the public. So at this time between 1996 and 1998, what we saw were efforts, not just to get information from people, to get their ideas, their perspectives, on the constitution and how it should be reformed, but also to provide a level of information and to raise some public awareness. And what has waned in the interim is exactly this. So one of the most common things that people ask me is what is a republic? How can we gauge public opinion on something that people do not even know what it is? What is a republic? And this leads to a lot of other questions. So first of all, I, I know that this question is connected to a lot of misinformation or misunderstanding. So there are people, as I mentioned previously, who believe that a republic is, they don't even see the United States of America as a republic because it's not called the Republic of. People call France, France, so they don't necessarily view that as a republic but they know about the People's Republic of China. They know that. So people ask, is it that we are becoming a socialist state? There is a view, um, one of the points that I have here, um, which is what will it mean for Barbados that becoming a republic may have meant instability because some of the republics that we know about, for instance, some across Latin America and in other parts of the world, have been unstable. So will this lead to instability? And I often ask people, well, what is it that you believe that the British monarchy is doing to guarantee stability in Barbados? Is it just the presence of the monarchy that offers stability? Because if, if that alone is what is providing stability, then we should probably have stability if we just make this simple change because the queen is not doing anything in Barbados. The governor general is not doing, I'm not saying that the governor general did nothing, but in terms of the actual governance functions, doesn't do a whole lot. Is it that the country is, be, is going to become a dictatorship? And this segues now with some narratives about the prime minister that emerged, I think are a little bit unfortunate to be honest, but People think, well, you know, this aligns with this view that the prime minister is a dictator. So 
it's hard to gauge public opinion because there's so much, there was so much misunderstanding. And then there are other people that kept asking about having a referendum. Is it a requirement? Should we have had a, a referendum? In our context, it was not required. Some people think it may have been desirable, but this takes me back to the other question. How do you have a referendum on something that people do not understand? So there's something that's really missing in here if we want to think about public opinion, and that is having people understand what a republic is, what it means, how it will change their lives, and in this case, how it really won't, how it really doesn't change a lot about their lives. This is critical. And I think that this is one of the deficiencies in the way in which Barbados became a republic. I believe that people were happy on Independence Day last year when Barbados became a republic. I think they were in general, at least in the moment of celebration. But I do not think that people really have an understanding of what this meant. I don't think there was sufficient effort to provide the public with the information that would allow them to have informed opinions. The favorite question that I have that people ask is, what will this change in my life? How will this change conditions in Barbados? There was a pandemic going on, still going on. Cost of living issues, crime and violence. Is any of this going to make a difference to these things? Is it gonna help the debt situation in Barbados or is it gonna make it worse? What will it do to our external relationships, our diplomatic ties? Will it make it more difficult for Barbados to enter financial arrangements that will assist with getting us out of the economic problems that we have? These are the really important questions that I think people need to have answers to. And the, the simple answer that I have always given people is that no. It will not change your living conditions. It's not going to change your day-to-day -day life in Barbados. As we have seen, although it's been a short period since November, it really has not changed our external relationships. Some might argue that our external image has improved since then, although I cannot say that this is a function of Barbados becoming a republic. It may be a function of the prime minister more so. It hasn't led to instability in Barbados, at least not yet. And it's still early days, but there's no reason to assume such. So this takes me to what I want to talk about next, which is, if the slides will advance, that as I said, there is no substantive change. This shift to a republic still means that there are no significant changes unless we go further and we reform or remake, which is different from reform, the constitution. This is one of the arguments that um, at the time, Senator Caswell Franklin, I believe was making, although he was sometimes maligned for making this point, but I think it's a good point that we really need more substantive changes to the constitution than the simple changes that allow for the insertion of a president where there once was a governor general. And this is what will change the character of this new republic from what previously existed. We also need to go beyond the constitutional law. And, and to be very fair, we are supposed to be going through a constitution, constitutional reform process that will take some of this into consideration. But we can ask questions about whether we have put a cart before the, the horse. Have we done things in the wrong order? Or was it so critical that we get the first thing done, that we break this symbolic link and you know, was it so critical that we could do it first and then we deal with the other issues after? I'm not really sold on that view because what if it is that people want an executive president or a president that has some executive functions? Then we go through the process of changing the constitution yet again to redefine this relationship between the president and the legislature. However, it will be formed after this constitutional remaking effort and the judiciary. I think we also need to go even beyond constitutional reform. The questions people ask about their lives, how will their lives change? The constitution alone is not gonna change people's lives, reform in the constitution. In some ways it can, some, especially in, in some of the areas that deal with rights. 
but we need to go even further. We need to rethink our electoral laws in line with the constitutional reforms that we may make. We have to think about our judicial system, how it works, how it doesn't serve people at times. We have to think about the economy, how it is structured, how it serves and deserves many, and about our, our social structures and what we can do to improve them so that we can get out of some of these very dangerous situations that we are seeing ourselves in with high levels of very brazen gun crime. And I would ar argue high levels of violence throughout the society, perhaps linked to the same colonial legacy that is steeped in violence and built out of violence. So we need an alteration in our systems of governance and political culture. Our political culture, I assert, is, is riddled with authoritarian tendencies. It is elitist and it is not inclusive of people. And this is a quotation from me in, in my 2019 book. And there I say, the system is built for order and stability in the creation of laws, other forms of decision-making and policy-making rather than for participation. So I think we need more inclusion of people if we are gonna make this republic different from what went before. Obviously, this is not the only thing that is required, but it is something that I think is quite important. These are some other quotes. So this view about the authoritarian tendencies, these are political scientists have long made these assertions about the authoritarian tendencies. We can look at the thought of Pat Emanuel, we can look at um, Carl Stone, so many, um, Tennyson Joseph and Cynthia Barajals make a kind of assertion to the point in, in their book. Um, Wendy Grenade, as I have here, David Hines. There are so many who write on political science, political affairs in the Caribbean. And whether you are reading a text from the 1970s or from 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, the same thing comes back over and over and over again. And I found this intervention from Laming quite useful in framing this. So Laming quotes Beckford in Persistent Poverty as follows. I'll just read this. So Beckford says, interpersonal relations, the authority structure of the plantation I think I left something out there. Anyway, anyone with the slightest degree of power over others exercises this power in a characteristic, exploitative, and authoritarian manner. Laming then opines on, opines on the basis not only of this reading, I have some errors in here, forgive me, of this reading, but direct observation and experience. Almost all major Caribbean leaders over the last 30 years reveal this to be the central distortion in their relationship to the party, to government, and the general populace. What's the general relationship? An authoritarian one that replicates this plantation relationship. And even as we become a republic, we can still see these tendencies existing. And this is something that we really need to attend to as we reshape ourselves as a republic. My colleague, Wendy Grenade, Note similar in 2013, just to show that over time we have similar sentiments coming out. And she says, one of the contradictions of the Caribbean is its ability to sustain formal democracy within a political culture that lacks a genuine democratic ethos. Benign authoritarianism is a constant feature of Caribbean politics. This is what we really need to pay attention to, to me, more so than just being glad that we are the newest republic in the world. Okay, we have bragging rights. We are the newest. We have done it before other places, but we have to go beyond this. And I really hope that we will allow creativity and the ideas of people to bear on us rethinking what this Republic in Barbados will mean. And I hope that other Caribbean countries that want to go in this direction will do the same, that this will not just be a formal process that replaces one version of a post-colonial governance system with the same thing 
but under a different name. And I'm just wrapping up here, coming to an end. We need a shift in governance. We need our governance to be less authoritarian and elitist. It has to be more inclusive, collaborative, and responsive, responsive to what people need. And there is a, a kind of thread that runs through democratic traditions, representative democracies, that although democratic processes are supposed to represent the people, there's still a level of suspicion of the people and a level of elitism where those who govern kind of believe a little bit that they know better than the people and that maybe they are better than the people. And we see this in things such as the electoral college in the United States of America, where although people believe that they are directly electing the president of the United States of America, they are actually authorizing electors to do this on their behalf. And in this, we have a little bit of a suspicion that these people who form some kind of elite no better than the general public. And there are some ways in which we can give credence to this suspicion because we have seen some things coming out of the so-called public, the majority, that can be a bit worrisome. And, and this is one of the things that if we go back to the Republican tradition, this is one of the reasons why the Republican tradition is more caught up with freedom as non-domination than it is with democracy per se. And this is because democracies can actually, in, in the pure forms, the direct democracies, for instance, can lead to the crowding out and oppression of minorities. So there must be systems and structures in place within democratic systems, democracies as institutionalized, as representative democracies to guard against infringements on the rights of minorities and groups that, that may be viewed as different. I quote myself here again in saying about the shift in governance that truly deepening inclusive practices will require going beyond tinkering with existing political stru structures. We can't just tinker. One of the real difficulties in creating participatory participatory, sorry, governance approaches in the region is that the region's systems of governance remain boxed into the institutional forms established at independence. And these institutional forms established at independence were not really made to serve us. They were made to serve others in other places. And they were part of the system that kept us oppressed and unfree. So in rethinking what we need to do, how do we contribute to the idea of, of a republic going forward? I think we really have to be bold and creative in revisioning what it is we need and how we want this to look. So Republic republicanism is not the answer in and of itself. It is important, but only symbolically important if we do not pursue deeper changes. If we do not contribute to the meaning of a republic, why do I say that? The meaning of republicanism has evolved over time. And part of the reason it has evolved is because of occurrences in different places. I mentioned um, the great revolution in Britain, 16 in 17th century, the French revolution, American revolution. The Haitian revolution doesn't get any credit in there, but all of these occurrences and then the governance systems that they built out of these have contributed to our understanding of what a republic is. We need to also contribute to the understanding of what a republic is. Just as the, you know, the People's Republic have also contributed to different understanding of what a republic can be that diverge, I guess, from the traditional approach, we need to also make a contribution here. But we have to do this in a way that is clever and that does not do damage to some of the good things that have come out of this system. So the same order and stability that I sort of criticized in the previous slide is not something that we should look down on, but we don't want order and stability at the expense of freedom. I thank you so much for listening to me and that is the end of my talk.
So Khalil, you can take it from here. Okay, I'm not hearing. Okay, like if Khalil has just lost his connection. Oh, so dear. what I will do in the meantime is I will pass on the questions until Khalil can make it back in with us. Um, I do have a first question. I think the person may have misunderstood you, but we can clarify. Mm -hmm. uh, the person is asking, why do you say that the USA is not a republic? Oh, no, the United States of America is a republic, definitely. But it doesn't have it in the name, right? So that's what I'm saying. When people think about um, some of the questions that I've been asked about becoming a republic, a lot of people that haven't asked me about the US, they've asked me about Cuba, or they ask about China because they have Republic in the name. And you know, Barbados, we don't have Republic in the name either. But that doesn't mean that we're not a Republic. Although I hear people saying the Republic of Barbados. So I don't know if it makes sense to put it in the name. It is a Republic, but when you're a Republic, it doesn't mean it has to be in the name. You know, we have the United States of America, which more um, depicts the federal na nature of the United States of America. That is these states that have been pulled together under a federal structure. Right, so there's a combination of that and it being a republic. Uh, Khalil is back with us, so I'm going to turn back over to him. Yes, thank you very much. Um, you know how it is these days with <laughs> internet connectivity and so on, so my apologies. Uh, Dr. Hines, we, we have another question um, on Facebook uh, from Taitu Haran from WAND. Um, she's asking, where do you think the focus should be to transform the plantation model of governance to one that is more emancipatory and participatory? Uh, should it be, should that focus be on laws, uh, on the constitution? Uh, isn't being a uh, state, I believe um, she may mean small island developing state here, is that not a benefit in the emancipatory shift in governance? Yeah, I would say that being a small island developing state state has its benefits because of smallness proximity should definitely allow for us to engage with each other a lot more easily than if we were in China or uh, not even necessarily some place that is quite populous but quite large right and the population is spread out so we do have some benefits that we can see in fact a uh, former colleague Patsy Lewis she made a really interesting assertion about how easy it should be for us to talk to people and get information from people to inform governance because of how small our populations are. And I think we have to try and find ways to harness this uh, with the technology. It may be even easier to harness it than before because you do not necessarily have to go to every district, but you still need to do that because we know there are differences in people's access to the internet and technology. They're not just access, their ability to make use of them, their willingness to do so. So I think there are benefits in this. Um, in terms of other things for emancipation, I think laws are important, but the cultural shift is really critical. I even believe that there are many of us who like, I mean, regular people who kind of like the system. Well, you know, the hero in the crowd, um, kind of hero and the crowd kind of mentality. We like there, there being this person who is an authority figure that we look up to, which sort of flies in the face of what the Republican tradition is about, which is that we are all equal. So any of us, if we do what we need to do and we have the right skills and abilities and people are willing to vote for us, could be in you know, positions of elected positions. Um, so I think we do need to, to shift how we think about politics. We have to shift who we think should be in, in politics. And I also think that we as regular people have to maybe take some more ownership of the affairs of our country, meaning that we need to understand what is going on. You don't have to be a political scientist or a lawyer, but to really keep abreast with what is happening in your country and to be this check to ensure that those who are in positions of authority are not infringing on your freedom. 
Um, I th thank you, Dr. Hines. Uh, we, we have another question in the Zoom chat. Uh, what checks and balances do we have in place in our new republic to safeguard civil rights and social gains? Uh, and the person goes on to say, when we no longer have a benign author uh, authoritative leader, I think they may mean authoritarian leader. Mm -hmm. Well, we haven't changed. We haven't changed anything in our constitution that would affect any changes to what existed before November 2021. So I don't think there's anything new in there that that assists. What we need to think about as we go through the process of constitutional reform is whether what is in the constitution is adequate and do we need to add things in there. And outside of the constitution, are there other entities that we need to implement or to change to have these checks put in place? So one of the things that's very topical now is the Auditor General's report and what on earth we can do with the Auditor General's report if there's no one to chair the public accounts committee because we do not have a leader of the opposition. Is there a way that we can do something about this? How can we refashion this committee or some other kind of entity to make sure that this report is taken seriously and that we are not trod over? Because that's what is happening through a process of perhaps mismanagement. Some of it may be carelessness also. So how do we change these things? And we can also ask ourselves if the problem is the absence of a leader of the opposition, because we could say that when we had a leader of the opposition, we still had similar auditor general reports without anything being done. So maybe we need to think through some of the institutions that we have in place to make sure that there are more effective checks and that we have effective checks on, on things like corruption as well, that we give life to some of the legislation that we already have so that we protect ourselves from encroachments on our freedom. Um, yeah, there, there, there are two further questions on Facebook, but I think um, on that point of safeguarding civil rights, the person also spoke to um, a big part of what you were speaking about in terms of the Republic, um, in terms of the of people being at the center of it and, and the word itself being about the state being a public thing, uh, an important element of that because comes what or who constitutes the public. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, our history is such that we have had a long um, history in this region of, of exclusion of certain types of people. And some of that continues to this day. Some persons would assert to you uh, in terms of their ability to access the state and access participation on a, on a number of bases. And we see that in particular through the Bill of Rights. So I'm not sure how you would want to weigh into, into how we um, uh, sorry, weigh, weigh in on those marginalized groups and, and how we bring them into, into the conversation. Yeah, I like that question. Because I was, um, as you started talking, I was thinking about the Rastafarian community. And I really do not like this thing where people have to provide some kind of certification in order to have locks as a school child, especially as a boy. This is quite problematic. And I think that I do not know if, if this has to do with the constitution or if this has to do with us. Because I believe that as it currently stands, our constitution really guards against what happens to Rastas. Because this is, this is their religious practice. They should not have to, or spiritual practice. They should not have to prove this. In fact, nobody should have to prove anything in order to have a hairstyle unless it is dangerous or something. So I, I believe that there are ways in which we accept infringements on our rights that are constitutionally guarded, you know, and we accept them culturally, even though the constitution, you know, you could provide a constitutional challenge and you would probably win. Um, I do think there is some scope for broadening though. One group in particular, the LGBTQI plus community, I, definitely believe that they, I know that the Ford Commission says that, said that sexuality should not have been included at that time. And I think that's something we have to rethink because whatever you believe, what you agree with or disagree with has nothing to do with the rights that people have. And I, I think that this community has been 
not properly served by our constitution. And that is one area I think we need to look at. Um, Rastafari community has not been well served either, but I don't think in that case it's necessarily because of the constitution, but it's because of us. And I would love to see, I would love to see a little bit that focuses on the protection of children, constitutionally enshrined as well, because again, there are some cultural practices, things that we accept that I think lead to children being harmed. And we, we rely on other forms of legislation, but I think that these things should be protected by the constitution. I, I'm not sure if there are any um, commissioners from the CRC here today, but if they are, I'm sure that they're copiously noting. Um, oh, <laughs> I'm sure that they're copiously noting what, what you've said. Um, and and um, Raul Williams asked a very interesting question uh, in terms of the fact that when persons think about republicanism in the Caribbean, they often identify easily Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana. Um, but Dominique is often overlooked. Can, he then asks, can one say that population and territorial size are determinants of a country's outward appearance and acceptance of republicanism? Hmm. I don't know. I think Dominica and Trinidad and Tobago are pretty standard in terms of, they're very similar to what we had even when we were a constitutional monarchy. Dominica is a little bit different because it's unicameral. So it just has one house rather than the two. Um, Guyana is the one that is the most different because they actually took a quite bold step in experimenting with their constitution. So their system is different from across the rest of the Commonwealth Caribbean. I think people might recognize Trinidad and Guyana because of their stature, if you will, in the Caribbean. And maybe that's why they don't really think about Dominica. But perhaps part of the reason too is that despite being a republic, Dominica is not a whole not, lot different from the rest of the Commonwealth Caribbean states, nor is Barbados at this point either. Uh, indeed. Uh, Sonia Peter asks, would you say that there is a general lack of interest displayed by Barbadians um, in the Republican transition, or is it more to do with the fact that they haven't been effectively engaged? Mm -hmm. I think people haven't been effectively engaged. That's one thing. But I also think that for other people, it's not a priority. So if you are mm -hmm. thinking about how to feed your children, how to pay rent, and, you know, a republic is neither here nor there. You could be anything when your pressing concern is survival. And we, we do need to bear this in mind. So when we talk about participation in some of these things, it is quite likely that there are some people who really do not have the time, the space, the ability to apply their minds to these sorts of issues because they're in survival mode. And one of the things we have to try and do, I believe, if we are talking about justice, or justice being part of the Republic, is to ensure that fewer are and fewer people are in survival mode so that they can indeed participate in other kinds of ways and can bother to be engaged. So I don't want it to, to seem as if, and I think sometimes people act as if, oh, you know, there are a lot of people that are apathetic, they don't care. Maybe they don't care, but they could care if they had other things in their lives that give them the space to care. Mm. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's the best I can do on that one. So um, a question from, from me then, abusing my um, um, thing as, as, as moderator, would be to ask you if there are any ways, can, can we reach those persons uh, in the absence of, of other improvements that are unrelated in their own life? Um, I think some people will be reached if they get angry. So some people end up, some of the reasons we end up getting constitutional challenges are because people's rights have really been infringed on in a serious way. So you get those. So people become engaged when something happens to them. You have lost a loved one in a way that you believe is unfair and it happened to you because you are nobody. As people say, I ain't a body, right? I'm poor, I ain't nobody, I ain't got a fancy godfather or whatever. So these are things that can force people into action. I do want to say though that it's not just people who are um, living in conditions of poverty or facing hardships that do not engage. They're just there are just people who are more interested in the Kardashians, and we have to accept that as well. 
there are people who are more interested in, in other things, fashion or, you know, something else, mu music, not that music is not political, but they're interested in other things. And we have to accept that not everyone in the public is going to be engaged. Not everyone in the public is really going to care, but I think that we can engage more and more people. And even those groups of people who might be more um, focused on things that some people may view as frivolous, they too get engaged when they get angry about something. You know, yeah. lack of access to something or, you know, crime, the crime situation. This is something that engages people who may otherwise not be particularly engaged on political matters, um, what it means to be a republic. So sadly, sometimes one of the ways that people get engaged is when they face difficulties. Um, I think that we have um, Devron Bruce. Your, your, um, I think your, your hand is up, Devron. You yeah, hi, Khalid. Hi, Devron. Good evening to everyone, and really good presentation as always, Christina. Thank Interesting, you. you know, we've been talking about the role of republicanism, really, and that's bringing persons into the political system and just into the state and those various things, the democratization of the political system. But interestingly enough, one of the major contributors to that not being done, and one of the major contributors to the lack of inclusion is mm -hmm. the role of the political party. So mm -hmm. my question to you is, what is the appetite, or how, how do you gauge the appetite in Barbados and across the region really, in really depoliticizing the political system, in particular the political party, and how do we do that? And do you think that is a direction that the society wants to head in? where we recognize that political parties in many instances are extremely divisive and we have societies that are not as divisive as others, but yet somehow they're able to come together a lot better and really get all hands on deck in our small societies to really uh, instrument what is necessary going forward. So what is the appetite, would you say, uh, from your experience would be as it relates to the depolarization of the, of the political system? I don't think you can. I don't think you can. Um, political parties are kind of a necessary evil. So, and I really enjoy Petit's book because he talks about, for instance, political parties being factions and that factions are not good for a democracy, but we still need the factions to make representative democracy work. So, political parties have their purpose but they also are problematic so it is still up to people to keep political parties in check too and i think that we've seen some of that recently right keeping political parties in check so that if they're going down a road that people do not like they withhold support from political parties um i don't know i don't know what you can do you can probably create better structured political parties that are themselves internally less authoritarian. If we are talking about having less authoritarian state structures, I think the political party is a place to start to have democratic structures inside of them, to have rules that are followed. We're not basing what happens inside of there on favoritism by a grand leader or something that likes somebody but that these systems function better. And maybe in that way, people may get some more confidence in them that you can be in a political party, you can express your opinion, you can work hard and you can move up within the political party. Whether that means that you get involved in elective politics or you have some other kind of role or position in the political party, that may be useful in encouraging people in having some um, faith, if you will, in political parties. But, you know, in the end, a political party is a faction. And there's a level of, especially in our system, there's a level of discipline that needs to apply. And some people do not like that because they may not always stand for what the party stands for. So I don't know. Do you have any ideas on this? Well, first of all, we have to admit the fact that political parties can be extremely divisive. If we don't begin to have that discussion, we will not begin to have the discussions on how it can actually be, be, be depoliticized. So uh, I, I know the Scandinavians do a very good job at bringing, in essence, all fractions together structurally. 
But I think culturally, for whatever reason, we seem to enjoy, as you say, interestingly enough, there's not a lot of divides us culturally. There's not serious religious divides or not serious language divides or not, you know, extreme differences as it relates to class, but yet somehow we find ourselves extremely divided. And I think that culturally political parties have accepted that and really fuel that going forward for their own benefit. And I think, uh, as you said, if we're going to talk about the structures of the system, we're going to have to pull the political parties instead of there to really push, as you said, the meritocracy and accountability and inclusion. But I think structurally, we could also begin to think of how we, I, I would say, um, sorry, on campus, <laughs> uh, how, how we just bring both fractions together and work to a common goal. For instance, I think one of the areas that people can support would be having a national plan, a national plan that is devised by not just one political party, but both political parties, and there's a commitment on both ends, and all political parties really, and various fractions, there's a commitment on all ends that says this is the direction that Barbados is going, and we agree that this is uh, something that despite what government we have, we're gonna head in that direction on these major areas and, and areas that quite frankly are not divisive. Let's say climate change, things mm -hmm. such as alternative energy, things that you know would not divide uh, philosophically or, or cause too much division uh, politically. So I think we can have national plans for instance and start there where it is a collective approach towards that uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know. I still think that there, there need to be things that separate political parties. And I don't know how much separates our parties now besides personnel. Um, if there is a difference in philosophy or emphasis or anything of the sort. And I think that although what you're saying sounds good, if you're helping the government too much, then what are you going to campaign on at the end of five years? You know, everything went so well because we helped the government. So that's why I said they're a necessary evil, because in some ways you have to have some of that division if you are going to contest the election. You can't just be helping the government. You don't want to be um, purposefully stifling or stopping things from happening that are useful. But how helpful do you want to be if you are looking to replace that political party? So... Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that one either, but I just, I can't see, I know that we can be a lot less tribalistic, if that's the correct word, in how we approach um, our campaigning and so on. But I do not think that Barbados is too bad, if I'm being honest. I've witnessed election in Guyana, and, and this is not to say anything bad about Guyana, because I love Guyana, but it's just what was noticeable to me was how different the kind of sentiment was around what color clothes you are wearing on the road right? And Jamaica as well, Trinidad. I think Barbados is a lot more laid back. You could go to any political meeting, one night a B, next night D, next night something else, and it's okay. But I didn't always feel that way in some other places, but we have to be careful that we don't go in that direction either. And I think it's really important that our neighbors start moving away from that too, because we don't, that can also lead to some other things, violence, that we don't want to have around our elections and our politics. I absolutely agree, Dr. Hines. Um, but in terms of the very last thing you said about lessening that tribalism, um, not so much the, 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 the divisiveness, but the tribalism, are there any thoughts you have in that regard in terms of how we might stop ourselves from becoming like some other um, places? Actually, um, David Hines has, he's Guyanese. He has some good recommendations for how we can do this. So he talks about some areas kind of similar to Deveron in which there can be um, some bipartisan cooperation in particular areas. Um, I can't remember his exact recommendations, but he does have some, which I think he's well-placed to have because of you know some of the other things within Guyanese politics is not just about party, but it's also quite racialized as well that we can mm -hmm. do to try and diffuse some of that. So he's someone, David Hines, he's not related to me, but his views on this, I think, are, are really useful. I think there is also a, a, an idea about having, in terms of the electoral process, 
specific seats that are not connected to the political party. Mm -hmm. And that might be useful as well in terms of forming a kind of bridge where you have other people who are able to be elected. And I don't know how we would do this as, you know, really when we're talking about creativity, how are we going to get this to work properly? But having other people who can be elected, um, perhaps from, well, in our case, it doesn't really make sense, but in some other places, indigenous community, so that their view has nothing to do with party X or party Y, but something else. And they don't have to bridge across the parties because they're not going to be in the majority. So I don't know what kind of group we could think of in the context of Barbados that could work like that, but maybe some special seats. And if we, um, as some people have recommended, like Peter Laurie has recommended moving towards having a unicameral system as opposed to having two chambers. If we had that, it may be possible to have specific seats that are reserved for certain groups that may be helpful in providing some of those bridges. I don't know that if that is a, the perfect answer, but part of it too, I think has to come from the tone that the political party set as well at mm -hmm. the head. So if it is that whoever the leader of the party is, is fueling and inciting this kind of tribalism and it is reciprocated on the other side, this is what we're going to end up with. So I still think we have to look inside of the political party too. But there's some other things that we can do to help, you know, um, create other entities that are in between, in our case, the two major parties. Yeah, one one suggestion which came to mind as you were talking was um, a recommendation I think the Thorne Commission has made, uh, because of course, yeah. as you know, the those people's assemblies, mm -hmm. their political parties really, uh, significant restrictions will be placed on the ability to campaign and so on and the involvement of political parties uh, but also the suggestion that some i think three, three uh, yeah senate. should be should be in the senate but I, I wouldn't expect you to comment on that of course yeah i think um, that's interesting but i also think that um and this is a, a slightly different discussion i think that the whole senate should be elected and maybe that is a way as well depending on how you formulate formulate the process of election for the senate or you combine the senate with the lower house and just have one house, different formulations we could have that maybe take some of the emphasis off of political parties alone. Yes, because uh, of course as well to when, um, when, when, when we were to bring the discussion back, when, when we were discussing the definitional framework for the Republic as being representative, there's a big conversation these days about how representative our legislative institution really is, uh, given the current um, Westminster first pass system. Uh, mm -hmm. I've saved one question for last because it is a very short question, but it is um, quite loaded. And so Josh um, Oladaran asks, how do we prevent the Republic just being a repeat of the what he calls the 66 independence? Um, so I imagine he's referring there to the more negative aspects um, over the last 55 years. Well, right now it is the same thing. So we have to think about going forward, what we are willing to do. I, I am completely aware that experimenting with the constitution is something that people may be uncomfortable with. And I understand because we have done well in some ways that we should not downplay. Um, Barbados has been quite stable despite the difficulties we've had in recent years over the last decade or so. The country has done quite well if by, you know, external standards and internal ones too. So you don't want to play around with the constitution in ways that could jeopardize that. But I do think that we should be bold and brave enough to attempt to make some changes so that we're not still dealing with the same 1966 constitution. I know there are people that say that the constitution is something that really is, um, there's a view that it's sacrosanct and the most that we should probably have are amendments. I think our case is different from, let's say, the United States of America, because they actually, some people at least, because you know it was a very elite group, but they formulated this themselves, as opposed to what we had, which was, yes, there was some input, but a lot of this was a photocopy of a system that had a constitution, although not a written constitution. So I think we need to, we need to 
think about what we want. We need to think about what we want the president to do. So do we want a president that is basically the queen? We might not want the president that holds all the executive powers, but are there other things that we want the president to do? Do we want to see a division between the cabinet and legislators? We could say that we could have a system that is similar to ours, but divides these two so that there are checks that are possible. And I think we have to really look at our legisl the legislation in general, as well as our policies. And not just the policies, because sometimes we have very good things, but the perennial problem across the entire Caribbean implementation. Are we creating legislation that we cannot implement as well? And what do we need to do to implement things appropriately? So we can, we can get there. I'm very hopeful that we can move beyond 1966, but I think it requires a level of combination of things, bravery, but still we have to be very cautious in making sure that we, are, we don't let the bravery outrun common sense and you know, the practical things that we need to consider. Even cost is something to think about. Like if we had two elected houses, this may actually incur further costs and delay the legislative process as well, because there may be some level of negotiation that has to go on between the two houses. If they're both elected, we may have to pay the senators, the elected ones more because their functions would become more substantive. Did body. So there are some other things we need to think about to the dollars and cents, the practical applications. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. I think that we have reached the end now of, of the question segment. Uh, you, you began your presentation, Dr. Hines, by declaring up front what you thought were your limitations in terms of not being a historian or, or, or having collected any polls, but I'm sure that all who are watching would agree that, that that in no way impacted the very high quality uh, of your presentation. So I want to thank you very much. Uh, but before I end, I think it would, be it would be remiss of me if I didn't wear my other hat, not in my personal capacity, but as a commissioner to say that uh, the entire process of republicanism really um, isn't, has not so much finished. Uh, uh, of course, as you know, we are now in this period of constitutional reform and that if, we want this republic to be a public thing, then it has to be that the public themselves uh, engage deeply with us on the Constitution Re Re Reform Commission. Because of course, the output of our commission can only be as good. Uh, we can try as best as, can, as best we can, and I'm sure that we will, to engage the public. But uh, it, it takes ultimately uh, two hands to clap. And, and so I look forward to that engagement from the public. Uh, but once again, um, Dr. Hines, I, I, I want to thank you very much. And I want also uh, to thank deeply the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, as well as the Department of History and Philosophy at the University of the West Indies in partnership with the Argentinian Embassy to Barbados uh, for hosting not only today's very enlightening lecture, but also the several that have gone before. And of course, uh, this series continues again next week, Wednesday. And on that occasion, uh, the topic will be the nationalism impulse, the nationalism impulse. So that would be a very, very um, enlightening lecture, I'm quite sure. And that will be delivered by His Excellency David Comis Young, who is, as we know, the ambassador of Barbados to CARICOM, a person who is very well positioned um, to comment uh, extensively on that topic. So I want to thank you, the audience who attended, uh, those of you who asked questions, uh, and of course, Dr. Hines and the sponsors of today. Um, do have a good afternoon and see you next Wednesday. Thank you as well.